a great day to all. Now, our next lecture is on immune response. We'll talk about hypersensitivity, autoimmune diseases, and of course, my favorite, immunization. So let us start. So immune response. So there are two types of immune response. The primary immune response, which is the immune response occurring for the first time. First exposure to the antigen, it has specific antibodies appearing in the blood after a multiple day latent period. The secondary immune response is the response, immune response occurring on the second and subsequent exposures to an antigen. And with this response, there's a stronger response to a lesser amount of antigen. And of course, there will be shorter lag time compared to the primary immune response. So we have your, if you can still remember, you have your uh, humoral and we have your cellular immune response, your human immune response. Of course, this is your, the table that can uh, help us understand what is primary and what is secondary immune response. So the primary immune response is the first exposure of the body to your antigen A and there will be a lag period and there will be your primary immune response. You see, antibody concentration is small or low and takes a long time to produce it. So, this is okay. While on the second, sub second or subsequent exposure will be your secondary immune response. Okay. In your secondary immune response, there is the second or subsequent exposure of the particular antigen. And there is, see, here there is an abrupt increase of your antibody concentration to a much higher level and it will tend to uh, resolve the longer period of time. So we have the different types of your immune response. We have your cell-mediated immune response in which most Microbial infection in parts resistance and aging recovery. Your cell mutated immune response is centered in host defense against intracellular pathogens like your viruses and tumor cells. A suppression of your cell mutated immune response in cases of your HIV AIDS results in overwhelming infections or tumor formations. The cells the place in here would be your macrophages, your T lymphocytes, which has your CD4 expressing cells and your CD8 expressing cells. In your cell mediated immune response, it is uh, it involves cytokine production. Okay. For type one. When your type 1, uh, what's involved here is the production of your IgE antibody, which will be induced by allergen via the mast cells and eosinophils. These are players, mast cells and eosinophils. Thus, on the next exposure to the antigen, IgE will be induced and it will induce the granulation and release of your mediator specifically. Your primary mediator for your type 1 allergic reaction will be your histamine. And it can produce systemic effect like anaphylaxis and local reactions like your, in cases like your atopy, topic allergy in hay fever. And in your type 1, there is release of your active mediator from cells within seconds to minutes. Of course, again, your primary mediator should be your histamine, 
then by your prostaglandins and your thromboxins. Your histamine is primary mediator of the type of hypersensitivity. It exists in the preformed state in the platelets and in the granules of muscles and eosinophils. You just need your IgE to induce the release of your eosinophils. And the reactions or the effect of systemic effect of your eosin uh, histamine will cause vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, and smooth muscle contraction. That is, if you put it in the respiratory tree, you can have bronchospasms. So the, the treatment for such reaction would be the use of your antihistamine drugs that can block histamine receptor sites. An example of your type 1 will be atopy. So with atopy, atopy children has strong familial disposition, so it means there's genetic uh, reasons. It's associated with high levels of your IgE, and there will be symptoms uh, induced by exposure to specific allergens. Typical environmental uh, allergens would be uh, reactions like a respiratory allergy to pollens, dogwood, or house dust night, or foods like that cause, uh, example, would be your intestinal allergy to shellfish. Uh, typical example of your atrophy or type 1 would be your hay fever, asthma, eczema, and the formation of your cortical fever, and even anaphylaxis. The next hypersensitivity reaction would be your type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, wherein in this type, antigens of the surface cell combined with antibody which leads to complement mediated lysis. An example of this one would be your transfusion or RH reaction, wherein there will be cytotoxic damage on the membranes of your red cells. Uh, example of which would be autoimmune hemolytic anemia or there will be binding your immunoglobulin G antibodies to surface antigens and there will be antibody directed at the cell surface antigens that can activate complement or other effectors to damage the cells and this results in complement mediated lysis so your type 2 would be your blood transfusion reactions in there will be antigens on the surface of the cells and there will be antibodies which will lead to complement mediated lysis. So antibody involved will be your IgG okay? and it results to com complement mediated lysis. Examples of your type 2 hemolytic uh, reaction will be your hemolytic anemias and RH incompatibility. Another examples will be your drug reactions like your penicillins. Okay? wherein your penicillin and attach to the surface proteins of the red cells can initiate antibody formation causing hemolysis. There are also certain bacteria like pathogens that can induce antibodies that cross-react with the red cell antigens like your mycoplasma pneumoniae. So uh, the result in hemolytic amino. So this is one is uh, you can have a clue on your CBC initially, you can have your baseline CBC and then after a few days uh, with the uh, a patient suffering from pneumonia and there is a marked decrease in your red cell, you have multi hematocrit, there will be signs of hemolytic anemia, and then you can deduce that the offending organism is of mycoplasma pneumonia. Another example of your type 2 would be your rheumatic fever. So again, for your type 2, you have your AB incompatibility, compatibility, RH, your penicillin of immune uh, hemolysis, then your mycoplasma pneumonia infection causing hemolytic anemia. Next would be your rheumatic fever, wherein the antibodies against your group A streptococci cross react with the cardiac tissue. So this is a as example of your type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Another example would be your good posture syndrome wherein there will be antibody formed against the basement membrane of the kidney and the lungs resulting in the severe damage to these membranes through 
ductivity of complement are productive leukocytes. And the last example will be your Graves disease, wherein there will be antibody that will bind to the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH receptors and by stimulating that, uh, the thyroid causing hyperthyroidism. It means there will be antibodies that bind to your TSH receptors and these antibodies stimulate the receptors mimicking the, the stimulation of your TSH causing hypersecretion of your thyroid. So again, if I review, your type 2 would be your ABO and RS incompatibility and your uh, penicillin uh, allergy with hemolytic and hemolysis, your mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, auto, uh, hemolytic anemia, your rheumatic fever, wherein, and your good pasture syndrome and your Graves disease. Next will be your type 3 uh, hypersensitivity reaction or your immune complex hypersensitivity reaction. In this reaction, there is antigen antibody immune complexes that are deposited in tissues wherein the complement is activated and there will be recruitment of your PMNs or polymorph conductors to the site causing tissue damage. So your PMNs will cause tissue damage in response to your anti antibody autoimmune complexes. A classic example of your type B immune complex would be your acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or your agent acute glomerulonephritis, PSGN. And in your acute post-strep uh, glomerulonephritis, the onset occurs several weeks after a type uh, hemolytic streptococcal infection on the skin with nephritogenic uh, types of your streptococci and this nephritogenic type will, will later on develop antigen antibody reaction and there will be consumption of your complement and this lumpy deposit of your immunoglobin and complement component CP will be deposited in the glomerular basement membrane and they will recruit your polymorphonuclears resulting to inflammatory process that leading to damage of your glomerular basement membrane and your kidney. The last type would be your type for hypersensitivity reaction or your cell negated or delayed type of hypersensitivity wherein it involves the sensitization of your T lymphocytes that will activate your macrophages to cause an inflammatory response. Your type 3, it will, uh, your antigen antibody complement will stimulate your formula, formula, uh, polymorphonucleus. And now for your type 4, your, the, there will be sensitization of your T lymphocytes, which later on will activate your macrophages to cause. So it, the, the cells involved will be your macrophages that will cause an inflammatory response. For type 4, it is a delayed type. It usually starts 2 to 3 days or 30 to 72 hours post exposure after the contact. The antigen and organ last for days. Uh, examples of your type 4 or cell mediated delayed type of hypersensitivity would be your contact hypersensitivity, like uh, in chemicals like your nickel and formaldehydes. Sometimes you'll need a, a longer time for your body to react to it. Your plant materials like your poison ivy and poison oak, your topically applied drugs like your sulfonamides, neomycin, and some cosmetic soaps and other substances. So those are your type for. Another classic example of your type for hypersensitivity will be your TST or your tuberculin skin test. And it will induce the tuberculin reaction wherein a small amount of your tuberculin is given intradermally to a patient. Previous, if the patient is previously exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, there will be, you will elicit a reaction. There will be the reaction will be induration and redness or erythema that will develop and reach a peak in 24 to 72 hours. 
Now, after your hypersensitivity reaction, let's talk about immune tolerance. What is meant? What is the meaning of immune tolerance? Immune tolerance means just be tolerate or do not react. Okay. Generally, the immune system is generally tolerant to self antigen. If that will not happen, then we have auto auto uh, antibodies. So it does not usually attack the own body cells, tissues, and organs. When tolerance is lost, this is what I'm telling you, disorders like your autoimmune diseases or food allergy may occur. Now, after immune tolerance, let's talk about your autoimmune diseases. So, there are different types. We we'll talk first your systemic autoimmune diseases, which involve your collagen and your vessels. Number one on the list would be your rheumatic arthritis. Wherein in rheumatic ar rheumatoid arthritis, you have your inflammation of the joints and synovial membrane. And this reaction distress the heart. And the next will be your systemic autoimmune diseases. Uh, the second would be your uh, SLE or your systemic lupus erythematosus, wherein you can diagnose it clinically uh, using the mnemonic Soprin MD, which, uh, which are these are the 11 criteria. So you only need four out of the 11 to fulfill to make a clinical diagnosis. SSC, SLE is usually a disease of young women the present, usual presentation of malaise, fever, lethargy, weight loss, and a butterfly rash. So these are the uh, uh, 11 criteria. So the 11 criteria will involve serocytes. Okay? Your S will be your serocytes. Uh, meaning uh, inflammation of cellular membranes like your pleura, pleuritis, pericardi pericarditis with diffusion. O would be your oral ulcers. A would be the presence of arthritis. P will be the presence of photosensitivity. So that is soap. Brain B is for blood abnormalities. You can either have anemias, leukopenias, thrombocytopenia, thrombocytosis. It. And R would be your renal abnormalities. You can have problems with your renal increase in the entrea, blood in the urine, hematuria, microhematuria, pyuria, proteinuria, okay. and the presence of your anti nuclear antibodies. The I and your immunologic, your anti DS DNA, or your anti double stranded anti DS DNA. And N would be neurologic manifestations, seizures, okay? And M would be malar rash, presence of your butterfly rash in the malar area. And the last one would be, D would be the discoid rash in the shins, okay? But this type of rash is quite evanescent if this fast disappears. Next, uh, autoimmune disease would be your good posture syndrome, wherein this is a disease of the young adult man which affects the, the kidneys of the lung. Example of this is a percent of the reaction. There will be linear deposit of your IgG in complement in the alveolar and glomerular investment membrane. Thus, it uh, destroys the membranes of the kidney and the lungs. Uh, there will be organ-specific autoimmune diseases like your multiple sclerosis, okay? where in your MS there will be mononuclear infiltrations with demyelinization of the central nervous system. The presentation would be your motor weakness, axia, impaired vision, bladder dysfunction, paresthesias, and mental aberrations. Next will be your myasthenia gravis or your MD, where it presents with muscle weakness and fatigue. It results from faulty uh, neuromuscular signal transmission because there will be formation of antibodies or acetylcholine receptors. So there will be an autoimmune a destruction of acetylcholine re uh, receptors. Thus, acetylcholine transmission will be blocked. 
Next will be your chronic thyroiditis or your Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And it presents with enlarged thyroid glands and manifests as hypothyroidism. In hypothyroidism, there will be a low amount of circulating thyroid hormones. And the opposite of your Hashimoto's thyroiditis will be your Graves' disease, wherein in here, uh, the antibodies will be directed against the receptors of your TSH. It lets the binding of TSH, but uh, it, it, your thyroid stimulating will stimulate should be stimulating your thyroid. But it blocks your TSH. But what it does is, is to further stimulate your TSH receptors, causing uh, an of uh, simulation of thyroid gland to work. There will be proliferation of your thyroid cells. Okay. Your test age, uh, thyroid stimulating antibody mimics thyrotropin, and there will be overproduction of your thyroid hormones causing hypothyroidism and toxicosis. The manifestation of your Graves disease would be fatigue, nervousness, sweating, palpitation, weight loss, and fatigue. Fifth one will be your type 1 diabetes, your insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Wherein there's a autoimmune destructions of your beta cells in your thyroid of longer hands, the one that produces your insulin, your alpha cells produces your glucagon. So insulin decreases, uh, should decrease your blood sugar, and glucagon should increase your blood sugar. So in the destruction of your beta cells, uh, there will be an uncontrolled increase, uncontrolled glucagon effect. Because your insulin should decrease your your sugar, so your type one diabetes or diabetes per se it presents with that uh, three P's: your polyphagia, polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. And polyuria, so polyphagia is means you eat a lot, you are really a voracious eater. Your polydipsia is you drink a lot, you drink when even it is cold. Okay. But in our settings, it's is quite humid and it's hot. We drink, drink a lot. And then, if we drink a lot, we pee a lot. But the real test for uh, polyuria is that you will usually be waking up early in the morning or middle of night and middle of your sleep just to pee. But then when you are not diabetic, you should be peeing before you go to bed and later on you pee after sleeping in the morning. But you lost it with your diabetes. So it is a manifestation of a, a chronic hyperglycemia which leads to neuropathies, cardiovascular diseases, retinopathies, and even kidney diseases. The treatment would be the use of uh, esogenous or insulin and diet and exercise. Next again would be specific autoimmune diseases would be the production of your pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia where there will be defective RBC maturation because there is lack of your vitamin B12 due to its malabsorption. Your vitamin, the intrinsic factor are produced in your parietal cells of your plastic glands and these parietal cells are destroyed. Thus, the intrinsic factor for the absorption of B12 is low, so there will be vitamin B12 malabsorption and there will be now, it will now uh, transmit to the defective maturation of your RBC. Next would be your ITP or your idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. It means uh, idiopathic, we cannot identify the cause, it's mostly uh, immunologic. Thrombocytopenic means there is a, a marked decrease of your platelet. And purpura means you have skin manifestation with a rash, with a bleeding, bleeding um, uh, underneath your skin that is more than one centimeter. That is your purpura. So it's a large, be, uh, much bigger headache. Um, so there will be antibody uh, directed towards platelets. So there will be antibody mediated platelet destruction. And uh, it results to critique and giving problems and depressed platelet count without fever. It may manifest like your, your dengue, but it's an infectious, it's immunologic, and it doesn't have fever. 
So what's problem here will be there will be antibodies uh, directed to the platelets and the platelets will be removed by the spleen so there will be a uh, uh, remark decrease of your platelet leading to your lymphocytopenia. Next, it would be your guillain barre syndrome wherein there will be an immune reaction against myelin the myelin, a treatment K. So treatment sometimes it will be uh, supportive because they be for guillain barre can be an ascending paralysis. Okay. So uh, respiratory support is needed. Sometimes we can use steroids, or sometimes we can use uh, IV IVs. Okay. So, so the treatment for autoimmune disorders depends on the type of the disorder itself. And usually, we can use immune support. Okay, so let's discuss about disorders with early defects in cellular maturation. The first on the line would be your SCID or your severe combined immunodeficiency. And this condition presents in the natal period and there is a failure of the development of both the cellular and humoral components of the immune system with this uh, resulting to severe infections. The initial manifestation of this disorder may be failure to thrive. And there will be a common manifestation uh, aside from failure to thrive is the development of mycocutaneous candidiasis. The patient can be suffering from chronic diarrhea and frequent bouts of pneumonia. So without reconstitution or replacement of your bone marrow by bone marrow transplantation, it is usually fatal within one to two years. Next would be your congenital thymic aplasia or what we call your DGOR syndrome. In your DGOR syndrome, your B lymphocytes and immunoglobulin productions are unaffected in most patients, but there will be parathyroid abnormalities which can lead to hypocalcemia, presenting with neonatal tetany or seizures. Uh, manifestations of your DGOR syndrome would be mycognesia, hypertolerism, Loss appears with notch PMA and a short filter. That's the manifestation of your George. Next would be your X-link agama globulinemia or no, uh, no gamma globulinemia, that's agama or otherwise called your protons, agama globulinemia. In this one, okay. This is a principal uh, disease of childhood that presents within the first two years of life and manifests as multiple and recurrent sinopulmonary infections with more often offending organisms with the pyogenic bacteria and to much lesser extent will be your viruses. And with your extinct agama globulinemia, there is put up and response to antigen challenge test. The basic effect of this condition is that there is an arrested cellular maturation at the pre site. And there are disorders resulting from defective enzyme dysfunctions. And we just go through the list your ADA, your adenosine deaminase deficiency. You can have your pyrin nucleoside phosphorylase deficiency or your PNP and your chronic glasses. Next will be disorders with defective proliferation and differentiation responses. Uh, top on the line would be your common variable immunodeficiency. This is the most common, remember, most common serious primary infection, uh, primary uh, immunodeficiency disorder most common serious in adults. Our selective IgA deficiency is the most common primary immune deficiency in adults. Okay? Let us differentiate the two. The most common serious primary immune deficiency in adults will be your CVI or your common variable immune deficiency. The most common primary immune deficiency in adult will be your selective IgA deficiency. This is just the most common 
but this one is the most common serious primary immune deficiency. The third one is not that common, is your hyper IgM immune. The hyper IgM deficiency, the classic example would be the Job syndrome. Job is a biblical um, a character in the Old Testament. And Job was tested by Satan. He faithful be, to be faithful to God. And God allowed the test until he was proven to be faithful. So he lost everything. One of Satan's challenges is to, to give Job boils. Okay? Now there will be recurrent boils. Then, HIV AIDS. The most common immunity efficiency is for the burglar HIV AIDS. It's the consequence of chronic retroviral infection that produces severe life threatening CD4 helper T for sex dysfunction. So it's your CD4 that is uh, involved. And there will be opportunistic infection and there will be formations of tumor cells. Wherein your Kaposi sarcoma is the most common uh, HIV associated cancer, Kaposi sarcoma. Now, so much of that, then we go now to the lighter side. Let's talk about immunization. Okay, what is immunization? So immunization is just the provision of an individual with antibodies possessing power to destroy or inactivate the disease-producing agent or to neutralize its toxins. And immunization is the most effective measure in preventive medicine. It can be achieved via passive or active means. With passive immunization, the goal is to give a transient protection or alleviation of an existing condition and active immunization means the goal is to elicit a protective immunity and immunologic memory. So we have already discussed this one and um, this is a very beautiful table that uh, Differentiate your active from passive immunity. So we have three columns that says type of immunity, shock particle, and the examples of which. So we have your two naturals. You can have natural passive or natural active. So let's talk about natural passive. In your natural passive immunity, it is the placental Ig transport and your colostrums and the colostrum would be a natural passive type of immunity so antibodies are passed through next would be your natural active like uh, development of diseases formation of force antitoxin against pretilism and bacteria this is your natural active Next would be your artificial passive is by giving immunoglobulins for human IgG against that A and B, measles, diabetes, and tetanus. The immunoglobulins, okay. that is your artificial passive. And your artificial active will be giving you immunizations like your Hep B, diphtheria, DPT, HIV, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella. Okay, varicella. So these are your artificial active, so your immunization uh, that are given in the in the clinic or in the centers are artificial active. Let's talk about passive immunization. Passive immunization involves administration of antibodies produced in a different course. Okay, the passive immunity obtained by this method is limited to a few weeks or even months most so aside from the benefit that it can give there is still this it can be IgE production the development of your type 3 hypersensitive reaction okay, and the development of anti-allotype antibodies 
and be very be very careful with passive administration because persons with IgA deficiency at a least prevented reaction to infuse IgA. Captive immunization is done by stimulating uh, administration of vaccine to develop a disease-specific immunity. And active immunization played an important role in reducing mortality and morbidity from virus infections, especially among the young. So now let's talk about vaccines. So we have different types of vaccine. We have your life attenuated. And you have your killed vaccine. For life attenuated, these are your living pathogens with reduced virulence. So they are live, but they were the, the capacity to produce disease has been decreased. Sometimes a single application suffices. In this type of uh, type of vaccine, the microorganism reproduce in the vaccinated person, providing very good stimulation of the immune system. So really have to infect the person with the live vaccine, live organism or virus, but it was of a reduced virus. So, because you're giving live organisms, do not use this in the among immunocompromised persons because it can cause a significant pathology or disease. And also in, during pregnancy, okay, with some exceptions. Now, with the killed vaccine, so the organism is killed and made into a vaccine. So, your killed vaccine, uh, the protection often is not optimum compar in comparison to your live attenuated. The vaccination has to be repeated several times, so it will require several doses. So this is a the list of the two types of vaccine, your live vaccine and your killed vaccine. So we have your viral and bacterial, okay, for both vaccines, bacterial. So for the live viral vaccines will be your yellow fever, your smallpox, your MMR, your rubella, measles, and polio, the sabbing type, and mumps, and your varicella sust. So these are your live viral vaccines. Yellow fever, smallpox, rubella, measles, polio, the sabbing type, mumps, sabbing is your, your oral type, mumps, and your varicella. And the bacterial will be your BCG, bacterial toxoid vaccines, your diphtheria tetanus, okay? For your killed vaccine, the, the viral type will be your self-infected, your influenza or your flu, your rabies, which are killed but usually are grown into human diploid cells, your Hep A and your Hep B, these are all killed vaccines, uh, viral vaccines. Bacteria will be your cholera, your typhoid, pertussis, your pneumococcal uh, with 23 serotypes, okay? and pneumococcal polysaccharides, and then cococcus with serotypes uh, A and C, your hemophilus type B, your rickettsia. And your typhus. Okay. So now we compare your live and killed vaccines. Okay, so this is a very good, uh, quite busy table. Okay, so for the live vaccines, this must be attenuated by the passage in cell culture bacteriological means. So it should be uh, about decreasing virulence given as a single dose, smaller number of organisms are needed. They, the problem with your live vaccines is they tend to be less stable. Can be given by natural route. So we can check it, give it through mouth, okay? Induces antibody and T-cell responses. But the risk of spread of infection to unvaccinated individuals is quite high. Next for the kill vaccine, can produce from fully virulent uh, okay. organisms like your poliovirus and your typhoid vaccines. Given in multiple doses, 
large number of our organisms are needed, they tend to be more stable in comparison to your type. Adjuvant or, or, adjuvant or uh, substances to prolong and increase its uh, antigenicity required. Generally given uh, by injection and induces antibody but poor T cell response, T -cell response unlike your lie spread is not possible. That is one thing good about it. Now let's talk about conjugate vaccines. Okay, conjugate vaccines are conjugate vaccines are produced by coupling of bacterial capsular polysaccharide epitopes to proteins, that is your tetris toxoid, bacterial toxoid, or proteins of the outer membranes of your meningococcal. Adjuvants, again, are substances that increase the, increases the immunogenic property of an antigen when administered. Examples of your adjuvants will be your potassium sulfate, which prolongs antigen persistence, neuronal dipeptide, which enhances co-stimulatory signals, your alum will induce granuloma formation, lipoposysaccharides and synthetic poly Fibonucleotides will induce non specific lymphocyte proliferation. Okay. Here, these are your kill vaccines, your hepatitis B vaccines, your Hepa B, your diphtheria, tetanus and toxoid, the cellular pertussis vaccines, your H influenza type B, and your MMR are all included in your uh, expanded program of immunization. Okay. So your Hep B they are given to newborn infants. Okay. If ever the mother of the infant will be found out to be positive for hepatitis B. So these are hepatitis B surveys under the positive mothers. So your uh, the baby should be given a dose of your Hep B vaccine. 0.5 ml and Hep B immune globulin within 12 hours of birth at separate sites. So these are the other EPI vaccines, varicella vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, your pneumococcal. You can have your conjugate vaccines or your PCVs recommended for all children 2 to 23 months and is now recommended among the elderly. That's your pneumococcal conjugate vaccine or your conjugate vaccine or PCV and your pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine or your PPV can be used in older children from 2 to 23 months now. So these are given below uh, 2 years old and later on it was now a uh, recommendation, recommendation that it should be given in the elder and your PPV are usually given 2 years and above older children. Your hepatitis A is a killed virus vaccine and it will require two doses. The influenza vaccine is the only vaccine that is give, uh, recommended to be given annually with uh, those at least populations like those children with asthma, cardiac disease, sickle cell disease, HIV, and diabetes. But now it is not recommended to be given as a routine immunization. Children less age years or eight years are receiving influenza for the first time should be given two doses. All those who are less than eight years old should be given two doses one month apart or four weeks apart. Okay. So what are the factors that may mean vaccine failure? Our unresponsive this one would be malnutrition. Next will be interference and other unknown but uh, many factors will be uh, the instability of the vaccines and exposure to to breaking the cold chain uh, wrong mode of administration so those are the factors for vaccine failures okay but for immunologic unresponsiveness malnutrition interference interference meaning having other diseases can interfere with the production of your antibodies. No, no. So complications of, uh, of vaccination would mean virulent infections, material 
the vaccines can also spread disease allergic effects because some vaccines are grown in eggs okay so chicken egg duck egg okay so they can and the adjuvants can can cause uh, allergic reactions toxicity in some vaccines like the typhoid vaccines sometimes there are uh, a history of the presence of large amount of uh, salmonella which may have produced large amount of endotoxins salmonella is a gram negative can cause fever malay can can be reduced by infidel market and also the teratogenic, teratogenic properties of live vaccines because so they should not be given to pregnant women and live vaccines can cause diseases in a immunodeficient host and that ends my lecture for now so this one of uh, many lectures i'll be giving and i'll be uh, recording so maraming salamat po don't forget to click subscribe and your notification button and please click the thumbs up subscribe to my youtube channel and click the notifications up so that uh, whenever i'll have new uh, lecture videos they will be the first one to know please share also my videos okay to your classmates or to your friends so next lecture <laughs>